On behalf of the Kraft family, for whom we have a great sense of thanks for this night, we welcome warmly Mary Eberstadt. So tonight I would like to sketch briefly why some of the pieces of that puzzle don't fit together the way modern sociology and much of our culture says they do. Then I would like to explain what seems to have gone missing and give some evidence for it. And finally, I would like to say a few words about where hope for the future might lie. That from 1981 to 2004, in all but 13 European countries, religious practice fell as measured by attendance um, at church on Sundays and otherwise. So did profession of belief in God. That fell in every country. Uh, secularization, and contrary to what is said and has been supposed in quarters high and low, has not been synonymous with material progress and education. Consider the significant variable of social class. Christianity, in the mind of many sophisticated people, is, of course, Karl Marx's opiate of the masses. It's some kind of consolation prize for the poor and the backward. Everybody knows that better off people have less use for God than poor people, and that smart and educated people have less use for religion than others. Certainly, this is a stereotype to which many people would assent. If this account of secularization were sound, if it correctly predicted who was religious and why, then we would reasonably expect that the poorer and less educated people are, the more religious they would be. Therefore, the fact that these stereotypes are not correct and that the opposite has been the case in significant instances in and of itself falsifies conventional accounts of what really happened to the Christian God. Christianity, in particular, is intrinsically familial. It both privileges the family and tells its own story via family metaphors time and time again. This is a religion that begins, after all, with a baby and a holy family, and a mother who suborns herself to the child completely, and a loving, adoptive father. How could a story like that not cause confusion now when we live in an age of fractured and atomized families. How can you even explain a concept like God, the loving father, to, say, a teenage boy who's never known such a figure in his own life? I'm not saying these things are insurmountable. I am saying that the way we live now puts new barriers in between individuals and the Christian faith. And I leave it out on the secular quads during those years, uh, as I know, and some of your teachers will too, um, in many places, and especially in some of the most sophisticated places, Christianity was barely spoken of at all. And yet today, in a way that no reporter or researcher has yet done justice to, the situation on American campuses across the country is astonishingly different. On the Protestant side, for example, Organizations like the Christian Union, InterVarsity, and others now have active ministries in many places where they once had not a foothold. Similarly, the Catholic group FOCUS, Fellowship of Catholic University Students, um, has grown in the last 10 years to uh, become a dynamic presence on 70 campuses across the country, including almost everyone in the Ivy League. Then there are interdenominational or non-denominational groups like the Anscombe Society at Princeton, the Love and Fidelity Network, uh, and others which have grown to bring students together from all over the country. Nobody, repeat nobody, would have thought that collegiate revival on this scale was possible even 15 years ago. 